the life. Last call. Well, good morning. It's good to be in God's house today. February 4th, 2024. This is it. The Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Let's all stand. Turn our hymnals to hymn number 496. Hymn number 496. Uh, Victory in Jesus. Children, 
Her love was for the Lord, her family. She loved this church. She loved this church. And I've been in the ministry for, well, I would say 45 years ago today, uh, but I've never had someone love me like Miss Betty. And she's the first person that, that got me to start hugging a woman. I started to say, I'm not a hugger. You know, you know me for time. I'm just not, I just don't hug. I just don't hug women. And uh, this, but she said, now, Pastor, I'm older than you. I'm almost 30, old than you, 30 years old. I need a hug. And you're my pastor. And you're supposed to do what your, your parish, parishioner wants. So give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss Betty. <Mary. laughs> so just love teasing her. Love her. And she's, she's living that victory in Jesus right now. Yes. And uh, all of her other loved ones that knew Christ as personal Savior. They're, they're walking those streets of glory. They're in that mansion. And they're looking down from up, from up in heaven as that great cloud of witnesses saying, come on, keep on going. You're almost there. And so keep on keeping on because Jesus is on his way. And so, Brother Bob, Brother Jeff, if you'd be so kind to come, we'll take up our morning offering. We'll also open up with a word of prayer. As we go to a word of prayer, Brother Jeff, would you be so kind, please? <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, come be with honor and praise and glory. Thank you for the Son, Jesus Christ, for the ultimate sacrifice he made all of us on the cross. Dear Lord, I'd like to say a special prayer for Miss Betty. She is a special lady. And she, she showed us what the joy of walking with Christ is all about. Because she always had a joyful heart when she came in the house of the Lord. And I'd like to remember her that way, with that joyful heart, because that's legacy. And we don't know how many people she touched along the way. That's up there with her right now. And in the beauties of heaven, because Miss Betty took the time to talk to them about Jesus. So we ought to think about that when we're talking to others today. Maybe if we speak Jesus into their life, it might change it. Dear Lord, I ask that you take the, the cares and the woes and the worries of all the things that are outside that door and you just throw them away. And you, you, you throw your peace and your comfort on us now. And that we, we get the instruction we need to do. I ask all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. <laughs> Let's all stand once again, number 297, hymn number two number 297. 
Remember, God will take care of you. 297. Amen. Hey. 
last verse really gets to me because it's the fact is that, you know, we don't need prayer in heaven, right? Amen. We're going to be with Jesus. And so the writer's writing is that I'm taken off from this old world. And when I take off from this world, see you later, prayer. I don't need to, by faith, see Jesus. I'm going to see him face to face. And so the aspect of sweet hour of prayer is it prepares us to meet with Jesus face to face. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Look at your Bibles in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to talk about this aspect about, about prayer today. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verses 14 through 16 says this, says this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Because Jesus, after he resurrected from the grave, lived on this earth for several days, and then ascended up into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, not only is he is our mediator, but he's also our priest. It was he that used his precious blood to put on the mercy seat of heaven to give us access to the Father. It says, let us hold fast our profession because Jesus did it all. Stay steady, stay firm. Don't wander, stay focused on him. Verse 15 says this. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched the feeling of our infirmities. But was in all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Because he's up in heaven, because he laid, he, he laid himself and placed his blood upon the mercy of heaven, stay firm. Remember this. As you journey through this earth, that Jesus knows exactly how you feel, no matter what you're going through. Which he says, we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched the feeling of our infirmities. One of the things that in Christianity is that we've been taught to hold back on our feelings because feelings can let us down. But aren't feelings part of our being? Are we supposed to be so mechanical that we can't be ourselves? When you're going through whatever valley you're going through, how do you respond? The fact is this that Jesus knows exactly how you feel it because he went through those very things. He went through rejection. <coughs> He went through the fact that people that he lived and loved and cared about turned their back on him. He went through times of hunger, went through times of thirst, went through times of stress, went through times of loneliness, went through times of lack of sleep. He went through all different aspects of our lives to be able to say, I know exactly how you feel. That's why as I talked about this a little bit in Sunday school, the one verse I've used more than any other verse in the 20 plus years of being here is that St. Corinthians chapter 1 says that we are supposed to comfort those by the comfort <coughs> that ourselves have been given. Each of us have things in our lives that we've had to go through these valleys. And we've been comforted. You'll find out that the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And those feelings that you have gone through, that God is helping to minister to you through, you're going to find out that there are people out there that are going through the same situation. When I talk about a broken heart behind every door, you don't have to go very far to find out someone's hurting or struggling or stressing or guilting themselves or beating themselves up or feeling lonely and isolating themselves. I don't know how you felt, but there have been times I've gone through all those things and more. Say, so is it wrong to do that? I don't think so, as long as you're willing to understand that through all that, that you're not alone. You're not alone, because if you're a Christian, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So now we just, we just read that we're supposed to hold fast our profession, understand that no matter what we're going through, Jesus understands. Because it says, because let, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. I look at the next four words. In time of need. Because he is our great high priest. 
because he has placed his blood on the mercy seat to give us access to the Father, because the fact that he understands and went through everything that you and I go through, you have the right, without anybody telling you what to do, what you don't need to do, you have the right to go before the throne of an almighty God and say, Father, we need to talk. I need you. It says in time of need. This morning we're going to look at the essence about what can God do in our lives through prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we love you this morning and thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that we can sing sweet hour of prayer and farewell, farewell. Lord, I know that's coming, even so completely. Jesus, I pray that you help us today. Give us the words to say to encourage your people. Father, there is a broken heart behind every door. And Father, we're not sure what's going on with people, but you do. Father, we come to church with a nice facade on, but what's behind the facade, the reality is that we're all struggling with some form or fashion in our lives. And Lord, we think, well, I can't feel like that. But Lord, you've dealt with people that are self-doubted. And so, Father, I pray that today, whatever doubts are in our hearts and our minds through our lives and things, calm them. Minister as only you can. Jesus, we love you. And may Jim Pryor sit down. And may Jesus Christ take over. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be truly acceptable unto you. And Father, if someone who is not saved, may they be saved. But we that are your children. Encourage us and challenge us to get back up and come before you no matter how we feel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We live in perilous times, and unfortunately, many times when we are going through struggles and need help, God is sometimes the last option. Well, we must always remember that God is always on the throne. You can always find him there. Have you ever been in a situation that you need to get a hold of someone, and you called and didn't answer? Lucinda said she wanted to put an internal buzzer in me. So every time she get a, she could get a hold of me, she'd get a hold of me. It just seemed like every time she wanted to get a hold of me, I couldn't talk. I used to drive her nuts. And then I'd get home, she said, where you been? I'm at work. Why didn't you answer my phone? I couldn't. Why is it that you never can answer my phone calls? You drive me nuts. That's part of the, that's part of the marriage responsibility, honey. It's my job to drive you nuts. It's your job to get me straight. So, and so, it was, it was, it was great. And uh, so the fact is this, is that we've called people and no one's there. But you know one thing about God? He does need an operator. Especially someone that you can understand you're talking to. And he can talk to him directly. There's one thing that was said about JFK and his administration. And it was a standard rule that was this, that anytime the kids needed dad, it didn't matter what was going on, Cuban Missile Christ, all that stuff, my children need me, they come to me because they're my first priority. Can I tell you something as a child of God? You're God's first priority. And don't ever let yourself or anybody else t talk you out of that. You are God's first priority. Why? Because he came to, came to earth for you. He went through all those different things of this earth for you. Went to an old rugged cross for you. Suffered, bled, and died for you. And on the third day resurrected for you. And now sits on the right hand of the throne of God, intervening and advocating for us with the Father for you. Prayer is important, and coming before the throne of God is that much more important. First of all, we're going to see some steps to find help in these verses. First of all, we got to recognize a meeting place with God. It's his throne. Verse 16 says this, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That when you and I pray, we go straight to the front of the line. We go to the place where the throne of God is. 
It's the place where the presence of God is there and the power and the majesty and the glory is there. That when you pray, you go there. One of the things I learned in Bible college was this, is that, that when we would encourage our missionaries to pray, we find out a specific time. And I can remember one, one missionary, Brother Dan Neal, which is a missionary in the Philippines, and I asked him, I said, what time do you pray? And he told me. And so back then we didn't have emails, we didn't have texts, we had letters. And I'm not a very good letter writer, and let alone not just being a good letter writer, no one can interpret my own writing. <laughs> and so I can remember him writing to him and saying, okay, what time will you pray when you get to the Philippines? And let me know the time difference, and I'll meet you at the throne of grace. And for a year, at that particular time, which was 3 o'clock in the morning compared to hours of their time in the Philippines, we'd meet at the throne of grace, pray for each other. So how do you know that, by faith? Does God understand the time difference? Yes. So if God understands that, and you want to talk to God, talk to people about to God, go, go to God for, at that particular time. Praying for one another is so important. So when you pray, it just doesn't sort of float around the air and then God takes this, this prayer net and scoops it out of the air and reads it like some lottery. You are literally going to the throne of an almighty God. Secondly, conscious, you gotta be conscious that that meeting was made possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 and 20 says this. Hebrews chapter 10 Verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of, to, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. I have access to the throne of grace because of what Jesus did on the cross. See, that blood that Jesus shed was just not ordinary blood. It was the blood of an almighty God. It was precious blood, the Bible says. It was a blood that never dies. I was talking to a Christian. They were talking about going to heaven. They said, now, do we take everything with us when we get to heaven? No. First of all, we don't take this body with us. Thank God. Well, the other aspect is that we don't take because our bodies are flesh and they're corruptible. You don't take your blood with you. You're infused with the blood of Jesus Christ when you get to heaven. So you can leave your body, you leave your blood, you leave your clothes because you're going to get a robe of righteousness when you get to heaven. You see, when what Jesus did was just not suffer, bleed, and die and resurrect, he opened access by the veil. See, in the Old Testament times, you could have one person come, that was the high priest. And he had to be dressed in a certain type of clothing. And they had to have these cords that were wrapped around the clothing, and they had to have a rope around his leg. That when he went into the Holy of Holies, the place to sacrifice for the year, that if there was something in his life that wasn't right, he'd fall over dead. Why? Because the presence of God was there. Only one person could go there. So what happens if he died? That's the purpose of the rope. Because if you walked into that Holy of Holies and you're not right, you die also. And so literally, you pull them out until the next year. Can you imagine going a year without knowing someone is talking to God for you? Or you're not able to talk to God yourself. The blood of Jesus Christ is placed upon the mercy seat. Gives us 24 acts, 24 7 access to God Almighty. You see, the veil was opened. It was ripped in two. See, it wasn't horizontally cut or however that fell apart, but it was vertically cut and separated, which opened the door to anyone, <coughs> anywhere, anyhow, to know my God. It was that blood that was placed upon our lives to change our lives. It's the blood that when God looks at us through, looks at us just as if we'd never sinned. 
That's the blood that we have that's applied to our lives. That's the significance of when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin, not sins, the sin of the world. It's because the yearly sacrifices, they'd have to have a special lamb. Jesus was that special lamb. You see, in Old Testament times, before they would perform the sacrifice, the high priest would take all the sins of the nation, find a goat, place it upon the head of the goat, and cast it off in the wilderness, hence the, the title of scapegoat. He took care of all the sins. But that was on a yearly basis. That when Jesus said to tell us that I meant paid in full, now and forever. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. But also understand that obedience brings us to his throne. Look at chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. It says this. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now what is faith? Faith is something that things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The fact is that I've never seen God, but I believe God. I've never physically touched God, but I can sense his presence. How do you know? Because of faith. I was thinking about your family through all this and just, re just reliving because we're coming up on less than a month that we uh, celebrate the year and the of this this past. And just how it all went. And I said this to the church that the difference between a Christian Passing and a non Christian passing is night and day. I think about the fact that when Lucinda took her last breath, it was very simple. The lady came from the hospice to come and give her a bath, and she lifted her up to take off her shirt. She took her last breath. And all of a sudden, I said, She's gone. No, she's not. She's gone. And she said, but it seems so peaceful. It seemed like everything's okay. I said, ma'am, it is okay. Because she's no, no longer having to suffer with all the debilitating things that's gone through her life. She's in a much better place. That she's not in that coma anymore. She's been released. And as I relived the last month and the, light, the net last year, she came to the two dinners. And that was the last time she came. And just reliving those different things, and you're going to relive those things too. And there's nothing wrong with that cry. I was, while I was cooking last night and making banana bread and getting prepared for the day and, and everything like that, I turned on some songs about heaven and just wept. How beautiful heaven must be. What is it going to be like when I finally leave this old world of sorrow and pain and suffering? Maybe it's just kind of like blinking. That to be from here into a much better place. That you're no longer sounding like Rice Krispies when you're trying to walk. <laughs> you're snapping and cracking and popping everywhere you go. That the sinner said, I used to walk like a, a, like a penguin. No more penguin walking when I get to heaven, I promise you. <laughs> no more problems with breathing. No more problems with health. No more problems with finances. No more problems with relationships. No more problems with, with family. No more problems with anything because it's all taken care of. Amen. Because of him, I can draw a night of God. Because I know that to be asked for the body to be present with the Lord, but I know that the fact is this is that as God was taking the sin up to heaven, God says, I'm still going to minister to you because you're going to need my grace also. The Bible says his grace is sufficient. I'm going to wrap my arms about you and I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to encourage you and I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you peace. 
I'm going to give you the assurance, Lord, everything's okay. And I'm going to let you know that quit trying to rethink things because you can't, it's done. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for his faithful that promise. Ms. Bay and I talked a lot about heaven, talked about being a Christian. And we joke around and everything. And there's sometimes when preacher, I don't feel like a Christian. I said, can, you, can I tell you a secret? I said, you promise not to tell anybody? And she just looked at me. She wouldn't say yes or not. I said, do you know sometimes as a preacher, I don't feel like a Christian sometimes? Why? Because I'm human. No. This is going to be okay. So what do you do? I try to get my, keep myself out of trouble. That's what I do. <laughs> but the fact is this. Is that I'm now in a position by faith that I don't understand everything. I don't, don't even think I can understand everything. But I do know this, that day by day, God wakes me up, gives me this new grace and new mercy that I need for what I'm going to go through. Sometimes that's a lot of, a lot of grace, and sometimes it may not as much as I think I need, but the fact God gives me what I need. And so when I go to the throne, I know that when I go and talk to my Heavenly Father, He has everything I'm going to need. And the things I don't even think I need, He's going to give them because He knows me better than I know myself. But then also, we need to call on God for mercy and grace to help. Look at verse 16 of chapter 4. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That there's one thing Miss Betty was known for was her boldness. And she corrected me a few times, a few times about some stuff. <laughs> I remember one time, it was about 17, 18 years ago, I mentioned this on my uh, Facebook thing this morning, is that, that I was driving past the church, and I saw her white car, I thought, now what is she doing there? And it was hot. I thought, what is she doing there? And she was over here, and she had a weed eater. And I walk around the building, I could hear something, I thought, Betty, Betty, she didn't hear me. I finally go around there, and I'm making all kinds of gestures, and... And she keeps on weed eating, weed eating, and finally, I go behind her, I scare her. <laughs> I was afraid she was going to hit me with that weed whacker. And I said, what are you doing out here? It's hot. She said, well, you didn't tell us that we see a need to get that thing taken care of, and just don't ask, get it done. And so, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you I'm getting this done. If it's okay with you, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Have a great time. And oh, by the way, you don't need to babysit me. I can do it by myself. Yes, ma'am. She had no problem telling me things like that. We always had just, we can laugh about it, but the fact is this. When you have boldness, you have confidence. When you have boldness, you have an understanding that it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I'm going to do this thing because it's important to me. And so when you go to the throne of God's grace, is that you go into the only source that can meet your needs and nobody else can. I was talking to a friend of mine who called me up on Friday, went to Catholic Seminary together, and we were we related because he lost his wife with cancer, and so we've been talking about different things throughout the year. He said, Jim, do you ever try to figure out what the doctors did? I said, no. First of all, it would just blow all my circuit breakers because personally, they call it practicing medicine for a reason. And they practice on rats and use the results on human beings. I don't want to go down that pathway. I said, so, he said, how, how, do, you, how do you process this? I said, I've just got to go to God and say, Lord, you're the great physician. And when we first found out about the son having cancer. Okay, God, we need your healing. 
And so I remember many times on Sunday nights, the Sunday would after Sunday night, the Spanish church is back there, and they're, they're singing, and they're praising the Lord. We'd be done, she'd go back there. And the Spanish church would stop the services and bring her in. And they'd lay hands on her. And they would anoint her and pray. And I would just be amazed to listen to the women praying with all their hearts and souls for God to heal this lady. Well, she got healed. And the confidence I have is this. Although it's not what I wanted, it's what God wanted and what Lucinda received. And so although God didn't ask me for my permission, I understand that what he did was for the right reason. And you're never going to ever understand everything about life. But you need to be bold about coming to the Lord and saying, there's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I have no clue what to do. Lord, I want to go this way, but I don't know what to do. Lord, I, sometimes I feel lost. I feel like, Lord, I just don't, I, I just want to sit here until you do something. And sometimes God let me sit there and talk to me, and sometimes he'll pick back up and kind of like my mama, pat me on the bottom and say, okay, get up and get going again. But the boldness of knowing that when I go to my Heavenly Father, He knows exactly what I need and how to deal with me on a day-by-day -day basis. But then also, look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 5 and following says this. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in this journey is this journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him, because of his friend, if it causes his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Fervency and earnestness of presenting needs. Here's a story about a man, he's sleeping. And his friend comes knocking at the window and says, hey, I need help, I've got someone here, I don't have enough food. Now you talk about coming to someone at midnight and asking for something that they don't have, but they need something. But it had to be some sort of relationship that they had enough confidence knowing that they went to their friend, although they may not like the circumstances, they're going to help. Is that not how God is? Most inopportune times, sometimes God says, I'm here. But that takes faith. And believing in what God can do and what God will do. Don't ever minimize what God can do in your life. Don't ever minimize or doubt the power, but also the personal touch that he wants to have with all of us. Don't ever forget that. And so it all goes down to one thing. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Look at verse 5 says this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God with that. Give it to all men liberally, and it breath not, it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that waveth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. See, faith is the answer. We may be inconsistent, but God is always the same. We may be erratic, but God is steady. We may be like the, the, the ocean. But God created the ocean. 
It doesn't matter what we are, God is exactly the stabilizing force that we need. And as we go through life, as we go through troubles and trials and situations that challenge us and frustrate us and sometimes anger us or kind of say, Lord, I don't know, I have no idea what to do. God says, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. And when you know that he is God, then you can have access to the one that created everything. We serve an amazing God. And yes, troubles are tough. And yes, there's broken hearts behind every door. And we're not sure what all people are going through, but God does. And sometimes we're more worried about other people than we are about ourselves. My friend Pat, when he talked to me on Friday, he says, Jim, what do you think you've learned more than anything else this year? thought about it. I said the aspect of self-care. We know that. Is that sometimes we're so busy about taking care of ministering to all everybody else. You neglect yourself. And then while everyone else has been ministered to, you're empty. There's one thing I've learned this year is that I am no good to people if I don't get what I need from God first. It's not selfish. It's reality. Because you can go, 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 go until there's nothing left and you burn yourself out. And then what good are you then? Listen, listen, listen you need to slow down. You're like ricochet rabbit, bing, 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 everywhere you go. Can I tell you that Ricochet Rabbit has got a little hitch in his giddy up right now? <laughs> and he's not bing, bing, bing all the time. Sometimes he just stays still. He says, Lord, I'm not leaving until you minister to me. Lord, I'm not going to leave because I need to talk to you. Lord, I'm hurting. And I need the healing touch of an almighty God. Or I know there's everybody out there that needs help, but I'm just as important. And let me encourage you. There's nothing wrong with helping people. In fact, I want to encourage you to help people. <coughs> but once again, you can't help people if you have nothing to draw from yourself. And you don't have to guilt yourself in that. Because I, I fought through that guilt stuff. If you're a minister, your job is to give, 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 and no, no. A man of many hats has to take one hat and put another hat on. So I take off the hat of being a pastor. I put the hat on just being a child of God and say, Lord, it's me. I don't know what to do. Can you spend time with me? And I will tell you, there's nothing as sweet as hearing my child come in. And I can just imagine as a little child going to their father and having the father pick them up and wrap their arms about them. So whatever's going on with my child, it's going to be okay because daddy's here. And may I say, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, he's here. My Heavenly Father is here. Come to him by faith. Meet him at the throne. He's there. You don't have to play hide and seek with God. Thank God for that. He is always there and he loves you and he cares about you. And don't think that because you do wrong that God does, God loves you. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard from people, how much they love their kids even though their kids just kind of just cause gray hairs or other things. That child of mine just drives me nuts, but I still love him anyway. We may drive that God nuts, but understand this. 
That love is not con contingent on who you are, but it's based upon who he is. <coughs> he is Almighty God. So go to him. Talk to him. Don't shame yourself. He says, come to me. All you that labor and, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Come to Jesus today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. With head bowed and eyes closed, Christians pray. We live in troubles at times. The people are hurting. We try to do it ourselves. <coughs> And God says, give it to me. My shoulders are broader. I've got more strength. I can handle it. And so, Father, I pray that during this invitation, that even as we leave this place today, the encouragements that come to you is, that's we, is in our mind. We've got to go to you no matter what. And so, Father, bless this invitation. Bless our lives. Bless what we heard today. So we ask two questions. The first of all, say, Pastor, I know that I know that I'm on my way to heaven.